This is Dean Rogers for The Rogers Review, therogersreview.com, Eclipse Magazine, and at 96.7 FM WERA Radio Arlington. Now, if you grew up in the 1970s all the way through present day, you would know our next guest on interview. He has founded one of the biggest R&B groups of all time. We are talking about the group who's responsible for Easy. Brick House, a number of the classics we grew up and heard through the dance halls, weddings, concerts, movies, TVs, commercials. We have Thomas McClary, who is the co-founder, one of the founding members of the Commodores, and he is now an author. He's now writing a new book called Rock and Soul. Thomas, it's nice to have you here today. Dean, it's a pleasure and it's an honor. Thanks for having me. It is an honor, especially since my mom had played the Commodore's music growing up. And it's like, no matter where you go, whether you're in your car, whether you're at a wedding, whether you're at a school, you always hear the classic songs. And they are so amazing. They have stood the test of time through all these years. Well, you know, uh, it's a testament to my, my son said to me, Dad, when your music can survive all the formats, <laughs> you have done something. And I guess... 50 years and still running, you know, we, we're blessed, you know. When I look at uh, the vinyls when they initially came out and of course cassettes and, you know, eight tracks and CDs and now downloads and streaming and, yes. you know, it just keeps going on and on, you know. We've been uh, very, very fortunate. And as I attribute that to what I'm referred to now as the signature sound. Yes, indeed, especially the signature sound as we heard on Easy that famous guitar solo. I just got to ask, how did you come up with the epic guitar solo that is familiar to all of us out here, not only in the DMV, but around the world? Oh, that's so kind of you. Thank you. Well, you know, um, just, just, just to collaborate with Lionel and all of the synergy that went into writing that song and you know, the lyrics and the meaning and the, and the powerful message of it. I wanted to ma match that with, you know, that same kind of uh, desire and that same type of grit and that same type of uh, penetration to the heart yes. and to the soul. And uh, I'll, it was, uh, man, it was, I, I, I reflect back every time I hear it on the radio uh, to the two hours that it you know took me to really get that exactly like i wanted it it took you two hours, two hours. what came out to what <laughs> only a minute, minute on the show in the whole record that's right that's right because i was never satisfied until it was like i said no nah, no nah, that's not i want another take give me another take <laughs> And it's funny that we're talking about Easy because Easy is actually featured in the latest film, Baby Driver. In fact, when I interviewed the director, um, Edgar Wright, and he talked to the star, Ansel Elgort, and he said, what is a song you could sing on the top of your head, you can memorize, you can think? And he said the song was Easy. And they didn't plan this on him, they just did it out of the blue when they interviewed him. And it's like, I can't believe that was the song they picked, and when they did the scene, it yeah. felt perfectly Perfect. and it became the song that his mother sang at the end of the movie. So how does it feel to have Easy in Baby Driver, which was one of the best films of the summer season? Well, I, it's an honor, you know. In fact, uh, just a little tidbit for you. Easy is the most played song in the history of Motown records. Get out of here, really? Yes, it is. Wow. <laughs> and so, uh, I traveling around the world with with my band and you know we're playing this song I've had local musicians come up from various countries and say man unless you play that guitar solo exactly like you did it <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> right yeah. right he says people look at you and, and go wait a minute that ain't right <laughs> you know you're right especially you know i've been through concerts for a number of years and it's like when i see the bands that i grew up with it's like they have to have that signature sound or the concert is a waste. We still got Philip Bailey 40 years later doing Earth, Wind and Earth, Fire Wind and, and Fire. hitting those notes yes, 40 years later. Yes. And you have to do that exact guitar, that signature sound, or it's like, nope, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, you know, I, I can appreciate, you know, each generation, and you're the uh, representing that next generation, obviously. 
that can still appreciate, you know, the energy and the, and the creativity that went into this. My whole thing was to, to try to set a new trajectory for music so that uh, it would be trendsetting and, and, and easy just happened to be one of the songs but throughout the songs that were recorded and Lionel Rich and I wrote over 50 percent of the songs and we I was really trying to make sure that that signature sound mm -hmm. be uh, something that is a part of that whole uh, thread through the whole you know arrangements of those songs. Yeah, it is amazing that um, the Commodores has been around for 1972 with Motown. So this is two anniversaries for you. This is the 50th anniversary when you started the band, and it's the 45th anniversary you guys have been with Motown. That's exactly right. It's amazing. So how did the band get started? I have to ask that question. Oh, that's a great question. I was standing in the registration line at Tuskegee University. As ah, a another HBCU. Yes, sir. I would say so. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what it's like as a freshman. You don't know anybody. And no. it was like a cloudy day. And it, in fact, it started to rain. Mm. And I'm like, mm, man, I had three other options of schools that I could have chosen. And I'm like, man, this is not going that well. And I, I heard someone whistling a song by Eddie Harris, a jazz uh, great. Mm -hmm. And it, the song was Listen Here. And it, and it was all the nuances of the solo that he was whistling. Yeah. And so I'm like, wait a minute. I turned around. I said, uh, excuse me, are you a musician? And this guy was very shy, you know, he looked down, he says, no, not really. I says, well, I'm looking to try to put a band together, you know, for the Freshman Talent Show. Yeah. And we're going to be the Black Beatles. What's <laughs> <laughs> up wrong being the Black Beatles? Right, right. Because this England, Liverpool has the Beatles, while Tuskegee <laughs> say, we have the Commodores. No, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And this guy says, well, you know, I'm really not a musician. He says, but my grandmother lives across the streets from the campus. And, I, and I'm from Tuskegee. And he says, I can round up some musicians for you to audition. Yeah. This guy was Lionel Richie. What? <laughs> so that is how you met Lionel Richie. That's how I met Lionel Richie. And so wow. I, I came to his grandmother's house. And yeah. sure enough, he had these guys. And so I started to audition him. Mm -hmm. And here he comes down the stairway mm -hmm. playing a sax. I said, I thought you said you weren't a musician. You're in the band. Just like that. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> and of course, you know, when you look at back in those days, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my kids say to me, Dad, man, it seems like it, it's harder to make it now than it is back then. Exactly. I'm like, come on, kid. It's it was hard to make it back then too. Yeah, it was. <laughs> okay. Especially you have Motown, which is run by Barry Gordy, who runs every band and makes sure whatever band he brings is a fine-tuned machine. Yes. Especially when they um, portray how he does it in the uh, Temptations miniseries. Oh yes. That's like if they don't make that cut, how many people would buy a sandwich or something else? And it's like people raise their hands. It's like. That's how deep Motown is. It's either you got it or you really don't. That's right. In fact, uh, we this is story is in my book as well. Nice. Uh, we defied all of that when uh, we finally got a chance to tour with the Jackson Five and we got a recording contract. Yep. We didn't go in the studio immediately. Wow. And everybody at the Motown family was like, "What?" And we said, no, Mr. Gordon, we're not ready to go in yet. He says, what do you mean? You guys just got through touring and you're hot and mm -hmm. ready to capitalize on this publicity that you've gotten. Yeah. We said, we understand your machine. We understand it has worked for the Temptations, the Miracles, the mm -hmm. Jackson 5, yep. you know, the uh, Supremes. Yep. But we want to record and play our own instruments. Oh, wow. He says, what? <laughs> and so... That's almost like, are you kidding me? I brought you on this. I spent millions of dollars to you. And you don't want to do this with me? Come on! <laughs> so, for two years... Two years. We stayed and went back to Tuskegee and said, no, we're not going to activate the deal because once you... Uh, and a lot of artists didn't understand. Mm -hmm. When you spend the budget... Yep. It's really you're spending your own money that's got to be recouped. Yep. And we said we're not going to activate it until we can do it our way. Mm -hmm. 
So finally, he said, you know what, you guys, I got to admit, you, you are really stubborn and bold about this. <laughs> Let him in the studio, leave him alone, you yeah. know. <laughs> so we went in and we um, had closed sessions. Wow. Which was another... Rarity. Yes. It, yes. Was, it was like, who are, these, who are these guys? Why do they think they're doing yeah. all this? Who are these guys? Are these Why guys? are they taking our money? <laughs> Why do they want this? this it's like you guys were the divas of the 1970s. <laughs> But through all your pain, patience, and diligence, you produce some of the best songs oh, that have stayed 40 and beyond years. In fact, this is the sto another story that's in the book. Mm -hmm. We, when we came out with Machine Gun, yes. this was the first gold record album mm -hmm. that in the history of Motown. Wow. They had, had gold singles from, mm -hmm. you know, Stevie Wonder, gold singles from The Supremes, yes. gold singles from The Temptations, yes. The Full Tops, yes. Gladys Knight, mm -hmm. never a gold album. Wow. So. And what year was that released? This was in 1974, before you were born. Yes. <laughs> a few years before I was born. Sorry, guys. I had to rewrite age just a bit. So in the 16 years Motown has been around, they finally get a gold, gold album, album and it's thanks to you. Yes. And it's like, yeah, I can understand why I can understand why these guys, these guys from Tuskegee <laughs> wanted to perfect their sounds. Yes. And it paid off. It paid off. In fact, uh, it paid off to the tune of acquiring our own publishing, which no artist at Motown at that time had including Stevie Wonder. Wow. It, own, had any parts of their publishing rights mm. and as a result of the Commodores getting theirs yes. uh, Stephen Wonder's lawyer his name was Vigoda he was a very brilliant lawyer yep. he had in his uh, contract what was called the favorite nation clause hmm. I never which, heard of that what's that all about the favorite nation clause says if anyone has a deal bigger than the existing deal that I have that my deal automatically, in terms and conditions, rise to the same standard. Wow. And that clause became very famous mm -hmm. uh, because athletes after that started to use that clause. Michael Jordan and all of the various act, uh, athletes. So the Commodores... You're trendsetters. We were trendsetters. And troublemakers. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say that, but you guys are trendsetters and troublemakers. But as I said, look at the results. That's right. And so, and as I reminded Lionel when I talked to his grandmother to convince him to be in the band, mm -hmm. that we were going to be the Black Beatles, that first album yes. was the biggest selling album in the history of Nigeria. And wow. we went to the Philippines on that one album mm -hmm. and we broke the Beatles attendance record. 272,000 people in one stadium. In one stadium at the Arenada Coliseum. Wow. Ferdinand Marcos was the president at that time. Yes, he was. And uh, we came, the military escorted us back to the hotel. And as we were coming into the hotel, we looked up to the balcony and we heard this guy yelling out the balcony, Hey, hey, who are you guys? I'm the greatest. Who are y'all? No. Yes. No. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we weren't big in the States at that time. So, wow. And then we took pictures with Muhammad Ali and everything. And he was like, man, this is amazing. You guys are huge over here. Absolutely. So, you know, Motown has been really good for the Commodores and we've been very good for Motown. Absolutely and it shows in your and shows in the songs that you made that's been featured in hundreds of commercials, movies, televisions, countless covers, dance halls, schools. It's like no one can enter a school, no one can enter a party without hearing Brick House or Easy and it's like you guys are troublemakers and trends are at the same time. <laughs> well, another story I wanted to talk about is I learned that you actually helped integrate a school oh, growing yes. up. Yes. Tell me about that story. Well, it's uh, Lake County. It was a school in Lake County, a public school in Lake County, Florida, um, which 
uh, in the city was used to Florida, and there was this uh, sheriff, his name was Willis V. McCall. He was n notorious. How notorious was he? He was so notorious that he was a member of the KKK, <laughs> and he had was known to um, lynch people in, in jail and he there were people dying mysteriously in jail and he every time someone would go to court and try to uh, get him convicted he would always get off the hook until this one case a uh, famous case that was the Supreme Court um, case where uh, Thurgood Marshall was one of the justices and uh, they finally got him Good. Yes, but I was the first African American to walk through the door of a Lake County school with Sheriff Willis McCall reigning as sheriff. Wow. And people uh, threw rocks at me, mm -hmm. they threw oranges, hit me in my back with oranges. They burnt my sweater while I was wearing it. What? <laughs> And what year was this, by the way? This was before you were born again. <laughs> <laughs> we got to emphasize before the time I was born. We have to. But I'll grant you that. You're one of the few people I will acknowledge. <laughs> <laughs> this is in 1965. Wow. And, of course, um, I was compelled because the school was closer to me. And, obviously... I was being bused to go across town to the all-black school. Yeah. Now, it created a little dilemma for me because I grew up with my buddies and, you know, we played, you know, Sandlot football and, you know, I was always the president of my class. I was on the honor roll. I was the quarterback of the football team and yeah. I was the pitcher of the baseball team. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I did this, mm -hmm. some of the... But as you know, they looked at me as an Uncle Tom because I was selling out to the white folks. And of course, the white folks didn't want me there. They were calling me the N word. So I was like, you know, just in no man land there for a year or so. But I knew that if I, somebody had to do it, and if I uh, was, uh, if that was my assignment at that time. Mm -hmm. And I gladly took it took took it upon myself to uh, to be a part of that, but the I guess the, it, there's a and you graduated from that school, correct? I graduated from the school, so we had a, a class reunion, yeah, and it was uh, a 25th or, or whatever that was. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife said, she said, you know what, you should go back to the school. Absolutely. I said, you know, okay, dear, I'm gonna do that. Mm -hmm. I go back to the to the 25th uni uh, uh, reunion. Yeah. And the students asked me, they said, Thomas, um, could you tell us for, take 10 to 15 minutes to tell us what it was really like for you? And I said, well, I would love to do that. And I, you know, I said, I want to thank everybody that, that threw the rocks at me. I want to thank everybody that threw the oranges. I want to thank everybody that didn't want me to take a shower in the locker room. And I want to thank all the coaches that didn't allow me to play the position that I've played, you know, throughout my high school. I said because it was gasoline that gave me the fuel and the grit to deal with the record industry and all of the uh, adversities. Yes. And look what you have done. You've helped propel me. And I said, and, and I wanted to come back and tell you that I love you guys. And love conquers everything. Yes, it does. And so as they cried and got their kids to line up to get my autograph, I um, hugged them and I uh, affirmed the fact that, yes, I went to school with you because they were bragging to their kids. <laughs> See? We went to school with somebody that became famous. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We drew rocks at him, we drew orange but oh my gosh, he's a Commodore. <laughs> he's a superstar. <laughs> <laughs>
But uh, this is another story that's in rock and soul. It's a really great read. It is a great read. Yes, it is. And in fact, um, we also talk about um, the humanitarian side of Thomas McClary, if you will. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, well, tell us a little bit about that side. Okay. One of the things that I've always wanted to do was to, um, I've always been, you know, giving, trying to give back to my community, but uh, I didn't realize how much uh, children suffered with lupus and, and, and arthritis. I thought it was an old person's, you know, and so we spent a lot of time raising money for that. Um, and another cause was for the elderly who didn't have health insurance. And so, um, in fact, Doc Rivers uh, was instrumental in, in getting me involved in, in that. And, and he had a golf tournament that he started uh, and earmarked the money toward uh, a nonprofit organization called Shepherd's Hope. And um, he was having the, the fundraiser at his home. And they were doing okay, you know. But I came and, you know, I said, you know, Doc, man, it, I think we could do a little twist to this thing to, you know, ramp up the money, you know, here. And I volunteered to play and um, we would, you know, uh, auction off the songs. And, yep. you know, next thing we knew, we were raising hundreds of thousands of dollars. Amazing. Yeah. And so for 14 years, I, I did that. And, of course, helping with uh, churches and their bands and their worship departments and getting them to understand the spirit of excellence could be incorporated with the spirit, but yet technically still have some great, great arrangements. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, another thing I've heard about your band, your band that you're currently with, you actually involve some of your family members in that band. Is that correct? Oh, you better know it. Man, I got to tell you, um, I have the twin daughters uh, that are in 12th grade. One is a prolific songwriter. Is that right? So, follows your lead, huh? Yeah, I'm blessed, you know. And she's an incredible singer. In fact, she's singing lead on our first single, and it's called Do It. Do It, okay. Yes, sir. I'm going to, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you're going to, before you leave, I'm, you're going to get a copy of it. Awesome. I can't wait to hear it. Yeah. And we have also a son, Ryan, who is uh, an incredible songwriter as well and a producer mm -hmm. so it's so much fun now having them tour with me in fact when we leave on the 27th we're going to the UK oh. uh, in Switzerland we're gonna be you know there for 14 dates over there mm -hmm. and um, it is oh man I can't even describe it it's almost <laughs> like uh, your dream uh, you're dreaming you have to pinch yourself each time I you know, know. <laughs> like I man know. is this really real but yeah, I know. I'm asking myself right now: Is this really real? I'm actually interviewing one of the one of, one of the members of one of my favorite bands of all time, and it's like I gotta pitch myself every time. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're kind. Well, thank you. Yeah, but I guess the compliment that we get constantly is, "Say, man, Jesus Christ! I heard you guys back in the '70s. Y'all sound better even now." How do you do that? How do you sound better than, you know, when Lionel was with you guys? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, <coughs> excuse me, very simple. When you have created the signature sound and you understand the chemistry of it, yes. it's easy to, you know, implement it and, 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 and uh, take it to that next level. So when you hear do it, mm -hmm. it's, it would be like listen to the Commodores 2017 and where they would be in 2017. Wonderful. So do you still keep in contact with Lionel Richie to oh, this day? Yes. yes, I do. In fact, uh, well, we text each other all the time. <laughs> you know, he, he uh, congratulated me on my on my venture here. And, and obviously, we, um, we were in um, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And he says, man, you know, I want you and Ronald, because uh, Ronald LaPre lives in New Zealand now. Oh, yeah, he does. So he called me up. He says, "T Mac, get over here, man. We got to come. I'm gonna, you know, why don't we just do something in New Zealand?" Yes. 
I said, oh, hey, all right, ain't nothing but a plane, plane trip. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the three of us, yeah. you know, went up on stage, man, mm -hmm. and rocked it, right? And let me guess, the crowd just oh, lost they it. They went, oh, <laughs> Dean, they lost it, bro. What did they have? And so we decided, we said, you know what? Uh, he was at the Essence Awards at the Superdome. He says, T Mac, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. He said, Ronald and Fred is in town. Yeah. Let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, the dome was like, the roof came off that thing. <laughs> yes, it did. Oh, it was, it was, oh, Dean, I'm going to tell you, it was really, really. In fact, there's a photograph of, of me and him. Uh, at that concert in my book. Oh, nice. Through all the years, you've been playing with the Commodores, songwriting, producing your own material, now writing a book about your life. What has been your most greatest accomplishment? And it could be multiple. Oh, that's awesome. Well, my definition for leadership has always been creating an environment for others to rise. When I, let, when I met Lionel, he was this shy guy who didn't really have any confidence in himself. And as I just stood by him and kept, you know, encouraging him to not only become a great singer, but a great songwriter. And now to see that same thing happening with my own kids, it, it's just like icing on the cake. You know, it's like, um, to see them developing, I mean, daily, and getting just to the point of being so prolific and, and, and heartfelt songs and melodies, mm -hmm. and being a part of that. It's like, man, you know, I've heard of cats with nine lives, but... <laughs> <laughs> Do you, you happen to have nine lives yourself, man? <laughs> That's right, man. So I have to say... This venture with my kids is probably the icing on the cake for me. Absolutely. And even though the book is not officially out, since um, you're going to have copies here at the Congressional Black Caucus for the next day, and it's going to be out next week, correct? That is correct. September 28th is the official release date, and everybody can get it on, at uh, Amazon and, of course, you know, Barnes and & Nobles and online and you can also get it at uh, my website thomasmcclary.com awesome one last question for the person and i'm going to put this out there so you guys better pay attention. pay attention for the person out there who has never and i mean never and i do not know why for the life of me has never listened to a commodore album mm. in their lives mm. what commodore album or song would you recommend they listen to first Ooh, that is a great question. I would say probably Commodore, Commodore. All right. Uh, Why that one? Well, that has such a variety of, you know, there's Zoom on there. Mm -hmm. There's Easy. Yep. There's uh, Brick House, obviously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, people have said to us on top, I mean, oh, man, countless times, I didn't have a rap, not really. And you helped me, you know, get my girlfriend. Or you, or I got married to your songs, you know, yeah. three times a lady. Or I was, my sister was dying of cancer and when she heard Zoom, it just eased the pain. So all of the emotions and all of the things that people have expressed to us throughout the years, you know, we don't take it lightly, you know. And so I have, I'm, I'm honored, Dean, that you have taken the time to um, do this interview. And again, thank you fans out there for all the years and all the support that you've supported us. We love you. And this is only the beginning, by the way. It is. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you've been around 50 years. Might as well be around 50 more. That's right. Why not? <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Thomas McCurry. Thank you so Excellent. much, Dean. The new book. Rock and Soul is coming out to your bookstores September 28th. Check them out at thomasmccurry.com. For The Rogers View and 96.7 FM, WERA, Rear Arlington, and EclipseMagazine.com, this is Dean Rogers, and you can read the review at those sites and in our radio show. We'll see you next time. Bye, my friends.